unless you guys have seen it already. I'm about to. Oh, okay. I'm looking at it. Exactly. Yeah, I, I, um, I'll, I'll tell you what I think of it on, on air. <clears throat> Alrighty then. Well, if there's nothing else, then I guess we can start. Well, there's a lot of things, but we can still start. Welcome to the continued podcast adventures of Superhero Speak. But I think many of the people that love this character and that love superheroes in general have used these stories as inspiration to say, you know what, I'm going to do something good in the world. I'm going to make a difference like my hero when I was a kid. That is my fondest memory of it, because when, you, when you're doing comic books, you want them to affect people. Right. You want people to care. You want, you want to strike emotions. And I knew that that clone saga was striking a lot of emotions. Can you yep. imagine Pulp Fiction starring Goofy and Mickey Mouse? I can totally <laughs> imagine that. I'm Don't sure look, somebody's written that one. Pounder with cheese in France, Mickey. <laughs> what? <laughs> the ale with cheese, Mickey. Yeah. I can totally so, I, I, would, I would watch the hell out of that movie. Yes, I gladly saw sacrifice that my, my progeny to you, a mighty Marvel beast. <laughs> <laughs> but Neil Adams is somewhere going, hmm, it's, it's my time. <laughs> uh, how do you measure success? Hey, everyone. You're listening to Superhero Speak. And I'm your host, Dave. And not enough time. I mean, John. And JD. I don't know if that's supposed to be dramatic or you forgot your name again. No, it's supposed to be stupid. <laughs> the the latter is stupid. Uh, okay, yes. okay, okay. Good, good. As long as we're all in the same boat. Uh, we are? I, I get the raft. No, I'm going to sink you again. Damn it. Uh, so how are your Spanish lessons going, John? Actually, pretty well. Muy bien. It, it's it's amazing the the breadth of different people you can meet when you're playing one of those online video games on on your phone, and <laughs> and the people that I become friends with, like I'm talking to people in Texas who came from Mexico. I'm talking with somebody in Romania, so um, it's pretty cool actually. I, I've never heard anyone refer to Tinder or Grinder as a game, but hey, whatever floats your boat. Uh, oh, it's a game, let me tell you. Oh, yeah. <laughs> just just don't hate the game, right? <laughs> no, you, you you hate the player. Yes. Uh, yeah, that's... Don't hate the game. Right, right. Or something. We, we, we said that so well. That was just, that was Shakespeare right there. <laughs> uh, so how was, how was everyone's week? How was your week, John? Anything new? I finished Cloak and Dagger. I was very happy to hear that they mentioned Misty Night in it, which means that, well, I mean, I know it's not really possible, but they are maybe trying to cursely tie it to the Netflix um, universe. Yes. Or or at least comics in general. But, but you know, my take is, hey, they me- they mentioned the Netflix universe. So, so maybe that might be something in the next couple of, of uh, seasons. We might see something like that. Or or get or freeform uh, you know tries to kill it and Netflix picks it up and it is definitely part of that universe, um, and it was good. People should see it. Net, uh, Cloak and Dagger was really good. Um, I'm about to start watching The Expanse. I'm halfway through JoJo's Bizarre Adventure for anime, and uh, other than that, uh, my house is close to being flooded because we on the East Coast. Basically, I've decided we are going to have all the water. Yes. All the rain. Yes, we, we decided that the people in California don't need any of it. We want it all. Yep. Yep. <laughs> you want it now. Yes. <laughs> I'm glad you so, understand. <laughs> yeah, we've had some really epic rainstorms around here. Like, like to the point of, I, I went online to figure out what the conversion is from cubits to inches so I could build myself an arc. <laughs> Uh, so what is it, John? Uh, very, very big. Okay, good, good. 
And 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 you know what the 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 conversion from from uh, chickens to USD is it's it's not a very good conversion. Let me tell you, <laughs> I'm gonna get soaked when I build that thing. Uh, oh yeah, that's right, soaked. The whole point is not to get soaked. Never mind. Go ahead. You're you. What, what about you, Dave? How are you doing? I'm doing all right. Nothing. Not, nothing new to report. Um, I ended up. Uh, what did my What did we end up doing? We uh. That that short term memory loss is you know one of the signs of aging. We ended up renting a movie that just came out on digital tag. Have either of you seen the the tag? Never mm-hmm. heard of it. It's uh it's um the voice of Rocket Raccoon. Uh, Bradley Cooper. Oh no no wait Bradley Cooper's not in it. It's Ed Helms. I'm I'm getting confused with a different movie. It's Ed Helms. Um John Hamm. Uh. And, um, oh wait, wait! That movie where they're playing tag. Yeah, they're, it's a group of friends uh, who, or adults who have been playing tag, the same game of tag for over thirty years. Um, and it's based on a true story, which is what is actually the most amazing thing about the movie. And uh, it was actually sad, pretty good. Sad true story. No, no, see, the whole philosophy that these guys have is. Um, you don't stop playing because you get old. You get old because you stop playing. I, I, I like the idea that they're trying to associate the concept of philosophy with guys that have been playing tag for 40 years. No, no, this is like, you have to watch the movie because the best part, though, at the end of the movie when the credits are rolling, there's actual, like, footage of these guys playing the game. Like sneaking up and getting each other, and uh, and some of the stuff that came, what was in the movie, are like, oh, this is so ridiculous. They did it in real life. So and and these are all men that like have like wives. Uh, one of them, like I think, like one of them's a doctor, and and uh, one of them is like I can't remember which company it is. I want to say it's not Amazon, but. It's, it's a company like Amazon. He's like the the head of the board of one of these like big companies. So yeah, mm. these are guys that have lives. They just still play tag with each other. Okay. All I'm saying is I highly recommend it. If you haven't seen it, go watch it. It's a lot of fun. How about you, JD? Did you go play uh, tag finished... with anyone? <laughs> no. no. No tag for me this weekend. Um... I finished my third novel of 2018. Ah. So that's where um, I spent the... How many spent, novels? Three. Ten? Oh, three? Wait a minute. Third. Only th- I'm, I'm going for eight by the end of the year, so i got to pick up. But I think I finally figured out how to get a rhythm going with this stuff. So I was going to say, moving forward. yeah, we're, it's in August, and you're only at three, so... <laughs> I'll get the next five. What, what, what novel? And what Eight genres? Novels. Um, you know, uh, sci-fi fantasy type deal, this one. Okay. Superhero-ish. Well, we'll, yeah, we'll have to talk. I have, I have a a list of maybe 15 to 20 series that you could get into that make it really easy to get through books because they're that good. No, no, no. A lot of different, a lot of different authors. No, no, no. I'm right. He's writing it. it. He's trying to write it. Yeah. By the end of the year. Right. You're, you're cray cray. (laughs) We know this. So, so well, I, I'm, I'm actually kind of curious, oh. JD. Is this? Are you doing self editing as you're going along? Do you have someone else looking at it? Over no, I got phone? someone else. I'm, I well, I'm, I'm writing. I do about three drafts, and then uh, my hand it off to a couple people to read it, and then I have a proof, like to do some developmental editing stuff on it, and then I got a proofreader who goes over it last, and then right now we're going into a stockpile because in 2019 all eight of them get released, and then we. We start the new phase of the career. I I thought the worst thing you could do was self edit while you're writing. I can't self edit. No, that's well. Some people like to do that. Some people like to write and they'll start the next day by going over and fixing what they write. I can't do that. I got to finish a draft and then go back and do the whole thing. So you know, that's my. You know, you 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 have a day job. You you coach uh, high school wrestling. You have a small child at home, and you've written three novels so far this year you make me ashamed to be a person and two comic book scripts but ah you're a bastard 
Yeah, that's it. Pile it on. That's good. Well, I don't do any. I mean, I don't do anything. Like I had when when Andy came along, I had to make a decision on what was important to me. So if I'm going to have the kid and do the things I want to do, I have to, I have to do it all. So it's what's what is important, and that's what's important. All right, I I, I need to get motivated. All right, jeez. Well, maybe I can find some motivation online from our followers on Twitter. What do you think? Well, that's Twitter, dude. We're well, talking Twitter. <laughs> well, it's time for JD's favorite segment, our social media social media madness. <laughs> Here we go. All right. So on, uh, we had talked about uh, the possibility of Red Skull returning to the MCU because he had been freed from the Soul Stone, and um, we had Yo Boy Cliff. Uh, he's I uh, can't. I'm not even gonna say the the at because it's just look for Yo Boy Cliff. Um, he said his response was nope, based solely on how cheap he was made in Marvel Heroes Omega. Uh, yeah, I read that and I didn't know how to interpret that. Yeah, it's a, it's a, it's an online game. I haven't played it, but uh, uh, but he basically replied. I said, "Wow, tough critic," and he basically replied, "If you played it, you would feel the same way." Um. And then Tim Berger, a former member of the Nerd Podcast Mafia, former host of Dork of All Trades, said, give me MODOK first, then we can bring back Red Skull. Mo- that would be a rough one, unless they redesign the character, because MODOK would be like complete, complete CSG or some really gnarly practical effects. I almost want the, no- the MODOK from the Superhero Squad show that I watched with my two-year-old, because he's hilarious. <laughs> I can see that. <laughs> um, okay, and then another one. We talked about Bedlam and uh, returning to the – wanting to well, Terry Crews wanting to come back as Bedlam and uh, Deadpool 3. And I had said apparently he didn't watch Deadpool 2. He didn't realize he died. And uh, Rob Foster had replied, DP was messing with time travel device when last we left our hero. Bedlam could have hitched a ride. Just saying. So, I didn't, I, you know what, I didn't think of that, but it is true, and, and they have come out and said everything that was in the after credit scenes is canon, canon. For, the next, for the next movie, so... Well, it, as much as anything can be canon for Deadpool, I mean, he could <laughs> basically, you know, go to his magic bag and retcon anything he wanted to. I mean, he didn't really need the time travel device, technically. True true but you know that's what makes him everyone's hero um and this is going to tie into something we're going to talk about a little later uh but if you guys remember when we had troy on the show uh troy and i were kind of talking about what they could do to bring james gunn back into the mcu and I, I, i believe you chimed in on this too jd basically the whole like wait a short amount of time he'll donate his fee uh for guardians three to a, a worthy cause and um we would move on well a couple people replied to that on twitter uh and uh it was murray road murray rude bard m rude bard uh at on twitter uh he is fired and he should stay fired <laughs> and Ren Grayson said people need to accept that he isn't getting rehired and to see who will take his place. Leave the guy alone. He's dealing with enough from his past until and it'll probably get worse which is why Disney won't rehire. So, What do you mean worse? They're insinuating that he's hiding secret things. I don't know. He's been he's been in the public for a long for for a while now. Everybody knew about you know this this these tweets and everything way back when. And Disney definitely knew about it. So unless he's really good at hiding something, which clearly he isn't. Yeah, <laughs> yeah, because he never deleted the tweets when he was hired by Disney. So you know, unless he's he's unless he's really good at hiding something, I, this is just. I'm sorry, 
this, Stupid. you know, yeah, it's over. It's, it's over. I know, you know it's over, but it's just stupid. And you know what? We're going to see the next, I, I don't, I don't care what they say. The next Guardian of the Galaxies movie. I, I, I don't know. I'm starting well, to think you, there's not going to be a next Guardian of the Galaxy well, movie. Well, well, we'll, we'll get back to that in another story that came out this uh, past week. Uh, when we get to our Marvel stuff. <clears throat> so hope, so put a pin in that guys for right now. Um, we do have an audience question for the week. It is from the one and only, uh, Mark Callis Rayguns, who has been a guest on this show. He is one of the co-hosts of, uh, So Wizard Podcast, another member of the Nerd Podcast Mafia. Don't forget Good to guy. check, don't forget to check them out, uh, at SoWizard.com or SoWizardPodcast.com or all of us at, uh, NerdPodcastMafia.com. And, uh, his question was, it's actually a multiple bar question, so hang in there. Uh, what movie have you seen in the theaters the most? How many times was there any non-genre without spaceships or explosions or a toy line? Um, and JD, you did answer this in the DMs, but uh, I did. But you, so you can go first. I, he really kind of put a qualifier. There's a lot of movies I've seen multiple times, but not. Not ones that didn't have spaceships and explosions. Uh, so I had to dig all the way back to probably Goodwill Hunting. Was I saw that in the theater in high school probably four times. Wow, I love that movie. Is that because you love uh, Affleck and, and uh, Matt Damon so much, or I really like Gus Van Sant, and Robin Williams was fantastic in it. Yeah, no reason to make it smarmy. <laughs> Well, then, good movie. Then why, do, why am I here if I can't make it swarm? That's you know, a really no, good question. I, got, I, got <laughs> I can't even make a joke off that. I'm off my <laughs> no, it is the joke. Uh, all right. Um, I, I like that answer. That's a good movie. I did not see it in the theater. I actually never even saw it in the theater, let alone multiple times. Uh, I didn't see that until it came out on DVD. How about you, oh great, oh Grady? What's the question again? <sighs> What's a movie that you've seen in the theater multiple times that possibly wasn't a, a genre type movie? Like no explosions, no toy line from it. Jeez, multiple times in the theater. I can't. I can't remember the last time I've seen. I can't remember the last time I've seen a movie multiple times in the theater. If and, well, is there and, anything? You know, I mean, I mean, well, I mean, yeah, yeah. I mean, well, there is one, but it doesn't fit the criteria because it was How to Train Your Dragon, and <laughs> you saw that multiple times in the theater. Yeah. How old are you? <laughs> it's a good movie. Yeah. It is good. It is a well-written movie, and it's it's got one of the best endings. I've I've ever seen because it is it's not a um, it's not a, a Mary Sue ending it's not a everything just works out it's a the character thought things through figured out a strategy put the strategy into motion and made it happen right. it wasn't this wasn't this last minute power up anime thing like a lot of movies do or or pure luck or or whatever so. Anyway, um, no, I mean, yeah, it, on, uh, let's, if you're not talking in the movies, since how I can't remember one that I would say, I would, I would say, um, oh, what's it called? Shoot. It's got, it's got the Hulk in it too. Um, Avengers? N no, 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 not Avengers. You said without a toy line, you right? Mean, you said you it's mean, got the Hulk in it. He means yeah, Mark yeah. Ruffalo? Yeah, Mark Ruffalo in it. Um, <laughs> begin again. That's it. Mark Ruffalo was in it. It's an awesome, awesome Saturday afternoon, Saturday night with wine movie. And there's no toy line so far as I know. <laughs> All right. Well, uh, I had to think long and hard about this because there's only a few movies that I have seen multiple times in the theater. 
Um, I'm definitely one of those, like, I, it really has to capture me to, to see it more than once. And, uh, I, I, <laughs> so, so the first one that comes to mind is based on a, co- on a comic book, but a lot of people don't know that it's based on a comic book. And that is The Crow. Well, I knew it was from a comic book. There, there's explosions in that movie. Yeah, there, there yeah, are. Yeah, you're right. You're yeah, right. yeah. The, the only <laughs> other one I can think of. <laughs> and I'm you know, this, this is actually a good category for this show because we all kind of have similar interests and stuff like that. And I'm sure people listening are going to kind of struggle to find this answer too. Yes. And I think I'm ashamed of this one. And it's, I know there's no toy line based on it. It's not based on a comic book. There's no spaceships in it. And I'm pretty sure there's no over-the-top explosions in it. And that, of course, is Interview with a Vampire. <laughs> you saw that multiple times? Yes. Yeah. <laughs> I have never seen that movie. Oh, minus, po- minus two points for you, Dave. <laughs> I did see The Queen of the Damned at the theater when, with my future wife. Because she liked those Anne Rice books, that was a steaming turd. I, I was about to say, <laughs> yeah, it was. Did she like it? Because no, she hated. It. She was like, yeah, yeah. that was the first time I ever took her to a movie, and she was like viscerally angry. Yeah, it, it was bad. <laughs> yeah, I mean, it's uh, yeah, like because they did a decent job on the first one, and then uh, the second book is actually Isla Stott, which is. Lestat story and why they skipped it, I don't know. I don't think it made a lot of money. I think that's what the reason. Probably. Like I don't yeah. I don't think it was a giant success like they thought it was going to be. Eh, possibly. I could be wrong. I'm analyzing a box office of 25 years ago. I, I, I saw it in the theater twice. I mean, you know. Anyway. Uh, so, moving on. Thank you, Mark Ellis, for that, that question. Um, that, was, that was hard. Might as well ask algebra next time. Uh, I couldn't even stay in genre. I had to go outside. So, so did I. I didn't that, stay in that genre was, either. That, that's, yeah, that was kind of the point of the question. Um, so, True that. so if any of you listening have a question for us you'd like to an- us to answer next week, again, slide into our DMs uh, at Superhero Speak on Twitter or uh, on Facebook. You can also email any of us directly. Uh, Dave at SuperheroSpeak.com JD at SuperheroSpeak.com or John at SuperheroSpeak.com and uh, we look forward to from hearing you from you. Uh, best bet is to email probably me or JD because John never reads his email. All right. I email? <laughs> uh, so speaking of my embarrassment with uh, Interview with a Vampire we're going to uh, um, we'll move on to DC News and Tom Cruise. No. Just no. So the Can current rumor this? is that the current front runner to play to star. This isn't a rumor; it's a curse. Green Lantern Corps movie is Tom Cruise. Um, so, so we've got. Uh, I actually shared the article earlier today and got two responses. Uh, George Mitchell had um, responded, "What the actual hell." <laughs> as opposed to the figurative help. Yes. And you, Russell, you know, you know I, I had to dig your email out of my junk mailbox because of this. Russell Richardson uh, said, well, Green Lantern is ancillary enough that I'm okay with this. The DCEU has a lot to prove before any of us fans can nitpick casting without looking like hypocrites. I didn't get that tweet at all. Warner Brothers yeah. DC has to prove themselves able to make quality films before anyone should question casting as a negative. It's wow. just Tom Cruise. You can you can question that anytime. So so Russell, I okay, Russell, I get your point. I I, you, I understand. you do? Listen, listen, <laughs> I understand what he's <laughs> what his point is. I I don't think he did a well good enough job expressing it. At least I think I know his point. I'm going to give I'm giving him the benefit of the doubt here. They have a history of casting people that get 
criticized greatly until we see the movie, right? Go back to Michael Keaton as Batman. And, you know, everyone loved him when the movie came out. Uh, Keith Ledger as the Joker. Again, arguably the best performance. However, can you name me a Tom Cruise movie in the last 20 years that when you walked into it, it's like, yeah, no, this is a Tom Cruise movie. This is Tom Cruise playing Tom Cruise in another Tom Cruise movie. I agree with that. Yes. I think the prop, I think the issue with Tom, so Tom Cruise has had a very interesting career, right? Like, brought about 15 years ago, he kind of lost his mind. And it's yep. been like, he Am relied on act, yeah, and it's, <laughs> which is a great movie. Um, I just saw MI6 last weekend, and boy, it was, it was a lot of fun. Like, silly, brainless action, but, but well done, silly, brainless action. So he's like, I was trying to say, he was kind of redefining himself with these action movies. I remember probably around 98 or 99, he was attached to play Iron Man. And I think he kind of kicks himself for that having not gotten done, which I didn't think was great casting then. And I don't see him at all as Green Lantern. That being said, can you imagine the lengths he would go to be Green Lantern? But he's 56. Like, oh, I agree. Don't get me wrong. It's awesome. <laughs> part of the part of the joy of Tom Cruise movies is watching how much further he slips into the madness while doing these stunts that get crazier and crazier. And it's just like, oh there's a party that watches this movie. There's a party that watches this movie. Was like, is something bad going to happen to him eventually? He's, like, I, I think he's going to die in a stunt gone wrong. I Yeah, but, I mean, <laughs> is he going to power his ring with dead mountain thetans? I mean, how... I, I, I can't... I have trouble... I have trouble separating his acting stuff from the stuff he does on the side sometimes. And I know that's kind of wrong, but on the, by the same token, yeah, he's too weird. He is, <laughs> he's, he's, he's a weird dude. No and, you're, and, you're, and you're right. He's, he's, he may have gone crazy 15 years back and, and, you know, like MI3 was like, I think the height of it. And he was, he was, it was like you said, he was even, he was, Tom Cruise playing Tom Cruise as Tom Cruise in Tom Cruise in MI3. But, but now, even now, it's like, it's, there's, some people have gravitas, which is good in a movie. Tom Cruise doesn't have gravitas. Tom Cruise is Tom Cruise. Yeah. <laughs> if, even, you know, at his, even at his height, Tom Cruise was always playing Tom Cruise. You yeah, know, you, like even you, going back to Born on the Fourth of July and stuff like that. Like that's a Tom Cruise movie. I think like he might be the last rate star, to, to be honest with you. Mm -hmm. You know, like there's there's an argument to be made that like there's not many actors that can pull movies anymore just based on their name alone. He might be he might be the last one. Right, and I think that's part of the problem. Is agreed. He's lived in this world where he alone is the draw for the movie, so they build the movies around him. So now you bring him in to play Green Lantern, which they haven't said which, you know, which one, obviously you oh. assume Hal Jordan. Oh. oh, it'll be Hal. You tell me, he does, do you, you look at all the Green Lanterns, you tell me Tom Cruise does not want to be the guy who's the test fighter pilot? <laughs> yeah, exactly. But Who's the but, womanizer? I mean, he's yeah, like, the, uh, Maverick yeah, with a ring. Kyle Rayner. Yeah, yes! Oh my God! Now I want to see it. But no, no. But this, 30, Thirty years ago. This, this is this is going to be like John Wayne playing Genghis Khan in The Conqueror. It's 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 you're going to look at it and you're not going to see Green Lantern. You're going to see Tom Cruise, and that's it. And and he's again, he's just not right for this role. I mean, I would. Maybe we can have Dead Deadpool take him out before it happens. <laughs> I'm just laughing at, at at John Wayne playing uh, Genghis Khan. I completely that forgot is, about that. But yeah, oh, that was, was a ridiculous movie. It was. It was. And 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 um, John Wayne, like even after that movie, John Wayne said, "I that was completely wrong. I should have never played that role." Yes. But but Tom Cruise is too much of an ego to ever admit that. Oh no! Of course. <sighs> we'll the see. last the last great time. The last time I can remember Tom Cruise playing a character. And not just being Tom Cruise. You ever seen Collateral, the Michael Mann movie with Jamie Foxx, where he plays an assassin who uh, who basically hijacks Jamie Foxx as a cab driver, and he makes Jamie Foxx drive oh, yeah, around yeah. L.A. Mm -hmm. and I've does all these hits. It. It's phenomenal. 
it, Michael Mann's the greatest crime film director of all time. Just getting that huh. out there. And he is so good in that movie. But that was in like 2003. And that's the last time I can remember Tom Cruise just playing a part and not just being Tom Cruise. And it kind of works too, because Tom Cruise never plays a bad guy. But that's the last time I can remember being, man, that was an amazing film. Not just, ah, oh, Tom Cruise is a lot of fun. Yeah. Yeah. So. <sighs> We'll see what happens. Oops. But again, <laughs> what if it's, okay, what if it's, he's playing the, the grizzled superhero at the end of his career looking for Tom Cruise to take his ain't place. gonna do that. No way. Yeah, right. You're he's absolutely, been, yeah. he's been playing 35 for the last 50, ooh, 24 years. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. yeah. And the man looks great. Like, He's like a walking Dorian Gray. Let's be real, but I don't, I don't think he's right for Green Lantern. Well, you know, if he's walking Dorian Gray, let's put him in the uh, a, a reboot of the Extraordinary Gentleman. <sighs> Ooh. Ooh, I'm sorry, I just have a cold <laughs> chill run up my spine. <laughs> well, I guess we'll just say only time will tell, and uh... Alan Moore rolled in his grave on that one. He's not even dead yet. <laughs> 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 and let's hope this doesn't come to pass but you know if it does it probably still in the bad, worst decision that they have made so far still, oh. still Suicide Squad oh. all I can say is thank DC for keeping me in mind when you make these decisions so I can keep on being the DCologist for this uh, podcast keeps, us, keeps the show moving yep uh, so speaking of DC and Interesting decisions. Uh, the Ultraman series received a folder from HBO. And it's Damon Lindenlof. He's the, uh, I believe, the showrunner on it. So, uh, I, do, do you know Lindenlof? I don't know. Yeah, Lof. Uh, okay. he's, he's one of Digibrum's producing partners. He produced the Star Trek reboots and a couple other things that I can't think of off the top of my head, but he's done quite a bit of TV. Oh, my. Well, I mean, if he did Lost, that, that'll be perfect for Watchmen because. You'll you'll watch the series, and at the end, you'll say, "I think it was great, but I'm not quite sure what I saw." Here's the thing about it, though: like, it's not really Watchmen. They keep referring to it as a love letter to Watchmen. It's almost like it's it's almost like a sequel to Watchmen, right? Yeah, we already had, didn't we? We're, we're yeah, we had that cat cat. cat I can't say the word catastrophe uh, <laughs> of before Watchmen a few years ago, and then. DC kind of brought him back last year, and eh. he did. Let's see. He also did the leftovers, uh, Tomorrowland. He's well, he did one, great. He did one episode on Phineas and Ferb, and then he did Ultimate Wolverine versus the Hulk TV miniseries. Took, no, no, no. That was a you can't be developing that was a comic book. Like that was the ultimate comic. It uh, took yeah. like six years to finish. Yeah, but he's he's the writer on that. He's a writer on that. So. He might just be credited. I think it was an animated thing, and I think he gets a credit because it's his story. Mm. Like, they adapted his comic. I think that's where that comes from. The executive producer on Lost. Yeah. Yeah, Lost was his baby. So if you have issues with Lost, they're Dave and Lindelof issues. Oh, okay. Mm, all so right. There, there you go. Well, start have a problem with Star Trek, too, so the reboot, at least. Will there be a smoke monster in The Watchmen? As long as they know what the smoke monster is, I mean, realistically speaking, is the smoke monster any worse than the squid monster that no, was actually no, in Watchmen? You're, you're wrong. There will be a smoke monster. It'll always be positioned right in front of Doctor Manhattan's thingy. Oh god! It is TV, right? Yeah, but it's HBO. HBO. The, you HBO? Know, we're gonna have tons of blue dog. Oh it's god, no! HBO. Giant blue penis flopping everywhere. Yes, <laughs> every every episode. <laughs> It's not fair. <laughs> yeah. Uh, so we'll see. I, 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 yeah. Again, you're right. They're not doing a retelling of Watchmen. They're not trying to, um, do the original comic series justice. They're not even. I don't even think they're doing uh adaptation of the before Watchmen comics that DC put out. Yeah, I think they're just doing. I think Lindelof just has his own take on the, the universe, and I don't. Again, that thing I just referenced about Alan Moore rolling in that grave that he shouldn't be in. Like, 
<laughs> Who, who's to say he's not sleeping in a grave every night? Well, that's, that's what I'm saying. Yeah. Alan Moore, it's entirely possible. <laughs> yes. <laughs> yeah. Well, we shall see. Um, keeping my fingers crossed on this one. I like the Watchmen. Uh, but, yeah. <laughs> we'll so see. let's go from bad to worse, then. Uh, what? So Marvel? Yeah. <laughs> so there's actually a couple... Uh, Marvel things that even just came out today. Um, one of them being that they have uh, revealed that Wolverine will have a new costume. Okay, can I just say I I see this the return of Wolverine cover right, uh-huh. and Wolverine looks lo- he looks like he looks like a Zarnian. What? He look he looks like Lobo. Oh. I, it's, it's, I think it's just the coloring. I think it's just the, the uh, Oh, I the think coloring. it's just the coloring. But he he looks he looks like Lobo. And and, and See, that's why, the, the, you, why did you put it in DC terms? You could have said he looks like Cree. Because he looks like Lobo. Oh, okay, good. Gotta gotta be honest. And and the the suit I've seen that kind of techno button suit before I can't remember where. It looks like he looks like Brett the Hitman Hart to me. <laughs> For my wrestling really? fans, yeah, like okay. no, it's like one of Bret Hart's jacks. It's got this like Sergeant Peppery kind of vibe to it. I think it, 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 I was thinking, it, and again, this is DC side. It kind of looks like some of the designs I've seen for some of the costumes for Krypton. I was thinking it has a Legion vibe to it yes. a little bit. Yes, you were absolutely right. That's that's what was in the back of my brain. So you're okay. saying that all of these characters are just big Beatles fans. Kind of. Well, <laughs> I, I feel comfortable saying Dave Cockrum is probably a Beatles fan. Okay, probably. Uh, just basing it on you know the years and how things were timed out. But I just I think what we're all kind of coming to is this just doesn't feel like Wolverine. But I get it. You got to sell comics and you gotta you gotta shine them up a little bit with the new resurrection. Yeah, but I kind of think when you're going Return of Wolverine, your first image is either going to be. The cla- you know, put them back in the classic costume, yellow, you know, the yellow and, and no, black. No, not the, not, not that classic. Come on. No, the classic's the that. bomb. The yeah. classics, that's the stuff, man. Uh, to be fair, <laughs> it is an issue too. Right. So he may come back. He may, in Return of Wolverine, he may be rocking the yellow and blues and for some reason feel the need to look like part of the Heart Foundation in the second <laughs> issue. Yeah, is that, that's because of his hair, right? It looks like he's got the greaser. <laughs> Oh, you're giving me ideas for uh, episode artwork. Um, oh, good. <laughs> I love when I do that. Well, here's the thing, too, right? Like, um, this is, you don't know if this was really just, because the book isn't out yet. We don't know if this is just something he's wearing because of the story. And mm-hmm. will it stay that way or will he go back to his original costume, you know? That's another thing, too, right? Any of these artists that get on these books want to put their stamp on the character in some way. Of course. Yeah. But we should see. It's, it's getting a sweet back-end deal off the toys and stuff like that. Mm. He looks like an anime character in this picture. Mm. I, think that's just, I think that's just Declan Shelby's art style, to be honest with you. Which I dig. I think it looks great, like, as far as the art goes. I'm not a fan of the costume design, yeah. but the, draw, I, the art itself is good. I, I don't see... I mean... You know how much anime I watch. I'm thinking, I, like, the old Star Blazers, one of the aliens from that. Okay, yeah, if you're going back that far, Star Blazers would be a good one. And Macross. They, what the hell is Star Blazers? Oh. Uh, <sighs> uh, uh, Star, Star Blazers, the large battleship in space with the Yamato gun in the front that could just blow away anything. Um, well, that was, they, it, the, it was a Lost in Space originally, and then... Right. It, and they could either fire the right. gun or, or, or flip a switch and use the same engine to fire, like, so they could go into, like, warp speed. Yeah. Uh-huh. Oh, or, and, and like I said, or Macross, right? Yes. Yes. Because a lot of the aliens huh. in those early cartoons were blue. Well, not... I wasn't just talking blue. I was talking the, the suit. Well, the suit as well, yeah. Because uh, I think I see in Macross, I think uh, that was um, that was that looks like the uniform that like the the generals wore or the um, 
admirals. So, okay. All right. And, uh... Things only we know for 800 of us. <laughs> All right. Getting off the subject that no one cares about, uh, let's get on to another one that no one cares about. Uh, so, Marvel has released the official full trailer for the season two of Iron Fist. You guys get a chance to... He's back to angsty again! Come on! I think he's okay. That he's not yeah. I think they all sound pretty good, to be honest with you. Yeah. Am I alone on this? You guys don't oh, like I, I thought no. it was... I, oh. I, look, it still looks better than season one. Yeah, I agree with that 100%. Yeah, I'm looking forward to this, to be honest with you. I agree, too. Um, at least... But but they it is continuing Marvel's... Um, was it... it uh, Marvel has this thing where, like, they, they skimp out on the bad guys, and so that is always just an image of the good guy, almost literally. And in this case, it looks like the same thing. So I will just say that to you, yes, but I have a two-year-old, and every other word out of his mouth is Thanos. <laughs> so <laughs> they might only have one great one, but they hit a home run with with this last villain. Oh, just, no, well, Thanos... Just throwing that Loki, out there. Loki and Thanos. Oh, Loki, yeah, Loki. Yeah, Loki was good, too. But, you know, again, they kind of cheap of all of the canon that they could have pulled from and they've got a bad guy iron fist so they could have they could have done better yeah that's the thing about marvels they fall into that formula so often because their characters fall into that formula so often like so many of the marvel characters top villains are just you know dark shades of of hero yes but to read the piece of news that came out on the same time why Why read about something when it can rage at it without knowing what it's about? So yeah. the other thing that... If you, don't tell me, if you don't tell me to read it, there's a good chance I didn't read it. <laughs> <laughs> so it was also uh, found out that Alice Eve is going to be in season two of Iron Fist, and she will be playing Typho- Typhoid Mary. Um, Thumbs up. So definitely not a dark reflection of uh, Iron Fist there. No, I like that actually. She's a cool character, and I like. I don't. I haven't seen Alice even much. All I can think of is she was uh, Carol Marcus in in the Star Trek uh, Into Darkness. Mm-hmm. She was she was the Star Trek thumbnail. Let's let's face it. <laughs> uh... I mean seriously, but no, she. I don't know. She might do a good job with it. We'll we'll see. So, <sighs> but I mean, again, we also don't know who the main villain is going to be. And we know how these Netflix shows go. It could be her for half of the season and then someone else for the other half of the season. So we'll see. But uh, no, I, I, I'm excited to see something different. Uh, Typhoid Mary's normally a daredevil villain, so I don't know if that means that uh, she'll be coming back at all either. Um. I don't know, those Marvel Knights things, they kind of, it's all kind of Daredevil, because Daredevil has the biggest rogues gallery of all those, all those guys, so you can kind of, you can kind of use them. I mean, like, who knows if, if they're going to get to Typhoid Mary on the Daredevil show, and they've still got so many pieces of the, the Kingpin thing to pick I up. I know. Can, and they haven't even done Bullseye. No. Yeah. No. That's because... can, can I ask you guys something, though? So, we're, we're going with the second round uh, well, or in uh, Jessica Jones' case, third round. But well, this 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 c- current round of episodes or or se- uh, seasons, right? For all of the Netflix stuff. Um, so far, I, and I thought I, I was hoping that this was just an outlier. But with Luke Cage, he it ends. Yeah, spoilers, everybody. But it's been out for a while now. Come on, yeah. um, it ends with him kind of. Uh, with one foot in the evil side and not really realizing it yet. He's like the, the, the frog in boiling water. And and now this 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 uh, trailer gave me the same feeling that that might be the direction they're going in with this character as well. Maybe. I mean, we'll have to see, but if that's the case, it, uh, I mean, and this is just speculation, it, it they could take, like, Stone and Nick Daredevil round two and be an like, entire round of seasons of all of these, uh, of what would normally be in a movie, the, the, the third, um, what is it, the third scene, uh, hero is, you know, in trouble thing, right? Am I explaining this well? Uh, to a point. 
Do you see what I'm saying? It like like instead of it being one season where you have the the beginning, the middle, the the hero right. turns bad or or whatever, and then at the end he's triumphant. They're doing that with entire, uh, with all the all the series is this whole season. Uh, well, I'm just getting this. I'm just getting this feeling. I, I you don't know? know. We'll have to wait and see. I, it would be a little disappointing if they all follow the kind of same arc. But it would make for a hell of a Defenders uh, series at the end of it. They'd all have. They'd all have to find their all their their roads back and then come together to fight the hand again, or or maybe the foot. That would be fun. The foot. Does the turtle show up? Well, hey, you know, it is it is canon in Daredevil, kind of, kind of, sort of, maybe. But but anyway, I mean that that's the feeling that I'm getting. So, because because you're right, um, JD. It wasn't he wasn't whiny, it, and it's de- it definitely looks 100 percent better than the first season. But it's still not the same tone that we saw from him in the middle part of the last Luke Cage series. Yeah. You know? Yeah. Well, we'll have to wait. Again, like I said, we'll have to wait and see. I, I, I don't see them doing that, but I could be wrong as well. Uh, hmm. Going for things we have to wait and see for to uh, what might have been. Uh, it has been recently revealed that Tim Miller's Deadpool 2, uh, before he left the movie, would have featured cameos from the Fantastic Four. Um, hmm. And uh, it appears it was based on the Josh Trank Fantastic Four versions. Uh, am I the only one who feels like we dodged a bullet there? Dodged a bullet? What do you mean? I think he could have made it fun. If anybody could have, it would have been Tim Miller. Like, I think it would have been some pretty good jokes. The, the costumes look solid. Yeah. I mean, the movie sucked. Like, but Fantastic Four suck jokes. So, it could have been a lot. It could have been funny. Yeah, but I mean, would you really want to... I mean, I guess if you're Fox and you know you failed, do you want to just then poke fun at yourself <laughs> like that? Isn't no. that what the Deadpool movies are? Oh, well, well, that's true. <laughs> yeah, but that's only because the Deadpool movies make all the money. Fox would normally not put up with that. Well, Fox isn't a thing anymore, so... No? Are we yeah, sure? This is true. <laughs> well, not a real, oh, okay. a real thing. Just a, pup, just, a, just a puppet thing. <laughs> yeah, it's Fox by Disney. <laughs> Fox by Disney. <laughs> all right. It's one... One more string on the mouse's marionette cable. Well, I'm curious. I, I I agree with you, JD. You probably would have just been poking fun at it. Um, but I'm curious what our listeners think. So tweet at us. What would you uh, would you have been excited to see a Fantastic Four cameo in the Deadpool two, or are you more excited that now they're back with the MCU and you want to see them at the event end of Avengers four? So because that's what I want to see. <laughs> um, well, you're not going to see them at the event. Well, they'd have to they'd have to add them in, right? Yeah, in the after credits because scene. because yeah, yeah, they would have to do that now that that's now that that merger has happened because um because it, it, that happened after they finished after they wrapped production. Okay, for two two things. Number movie. one, a lot of the after credit scenes, if you ask them, did like a week before the movie was released. So, yeah, it's yeah. so possible that way, too. Don't you think Foggy had something in his back pocket for if the went through or not? I mean, I besides, so. besides hatred for the, the TV series? Or? I think I said I hatred more than hate for the TV series. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Um, so, guys, we grew up, we all grew up in the 80s, right? Women grew up. I was, uh, yeah, yeah. <laughs> I was, grow up. I was a child. <laughs> okay, so I was a child in the eighties. JD was a child in the eighties, and apparently John was at bars and shaving in the eighties. Um, I was at least buying for people. But okay. But the, 
Uh, I, I, the, the, one of the cartoons that I have to attribute to me becoming a Spider-Man fan is coming back in comic book form. And of course, I'm speaking about Spider-Man and his amazing friends. I love that show. I am excited for this. What do you guys think? I, this was the, this was, this was everything to me when I was very, very little. Like, four, I I saw the reruns on in syndication when I was probably four, five, six years old. And this is why I love Spider-Man. This is why I love comics was because of Spider-Man and his amazing friends. So it definitely has a huge spot in my heart. Cool. Yeah. I, I think, I think they completely fail if they don't bring Ms. Lyon back. <laughs> that was, as long as they don't like do the, like a Jeff Johns version of what Ms. Lyon would be, where it's an actual <laughs> like lion and it kills people. <laughs> And it's all dark, and we have to have, you this is the Miss Lion you only dreamed about. Like, I don't really, <laughs> as long as they don't do that, I'll be okay. Um, of course, this is going to be in Iceman number three of the five-part miniseries uh, that'll be out in November. And it's written by Cena Grace and art by Nathan Stockholm, or Stockman, sorry. Um, so, so we're only, it's not like they're getting a, a full miniseries or anything, but just to do it for, you know, one episode, I, or one issue, I'm going to run out and, and pre-order it tonight, or maybe tomorrow. <laughs> um, yeah, no. Hmm. So, so, so I'll you won't get it. a Jeff Johns, uh, it, uh, this line. Or, <laughs> yeah. yeah, but you, you, I, I have the same feelings that you guys do about it. I mean, when you, and besides the Super Friends, this was like, the, one of the most interesting um, cartoons out there, and you know, for for guys like us that love the superheroes and the and the comic books. So, and and it's funny because after that, uh, Firestar kind of disappeared, didn't she? Yeah, well, she no, oh. she actually they brought her into X Men, and uh, she was a big character. She had her own mini series, and then she was in the New Warrior. She was a big part of Mark Gruenwald's new and Mark Bagley's New Warriors run in the late eighties, early nineties. Like this actually entered this broad Firestar into the Marvel universe. Right. Oh, is this another one of those um, uh, Harley Quinn things where she yeah, wasn't a yeah. character until it was on this, and then yeah, huh. they basically took John Romita's Mary Jane designs and built their own character with it <laughs> with spare parts. Well, kind of <laughs> I mean, like that. Science not, to this thing. I, I, not like that. I meant. I meant like uh, the people making the cartoon because there, you know, there was zero synergy between comics and TV back right. then. Eh. Cool. So, all right, so we're all looking forward to it. Uh, we hope yeah. that you guys are looking forward to it too. And uh, okay, so I, 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 we talked a little bit in the beginning about James Gunn, and I said, put a pin in till we get back to the story. Um, it is official, apparently. Uh, Marvel or Disney has come out and said they will not rehire James Gunn for Volume Three. Um, Good job, Disney. Well, I mean, I don't. Again, I mean, and I mean that with with much rage in my voice. It's like just good job, you know. You let you let somebody pull wool over your eyes. You you get it to yourself. And, and you're willing to get you were wrong. No, I think you're wrong. The dude had to be disciplined. I don't know if firing him was the right way. Right. If they thought, you know, if, if, if they thought he should be disciplined, then they should have never hired him. Because I agree with that. I agree with that. They knew about it at the beginning. Yes. yes. So it's they were lead into this. Yes, it's all ex post facto stuff. They bowed to Mike Cernovich, who's just a horrendous human being. He dude screwed up. I mean, I think having, I personally think having his name tarnished like this was is pretty bad and like I kind of like Troy's idea last week about you know I'm trying to make amends because I do believe people can change I do believe people can grow up and I don't I just don't I don't know man this is we're not talking about Harvey Weinstein here yeah you know I don't I don't see this as unforgivable but I get having to punish him I get I get the the backlash I do think that Disney's hypocritical on taking a stand on this thing when they've let so much else slide 
over the years, especially when it comes to off color humor. You mm-hmm. know, it's just like I say. I mean, the fact we're living in weird times, man. Like, we well, really are. Well, if they if if they're willing to do this, why don't they fire T.J. Miller from Deadpool? They weren't in control of Deadpool at the time. Uh, and okay. they probably aren't going to use him in right. the next it, one, would be my guess. Are, that, that, that's already been said that he won't be in the next one. That, I mean, yeah, that was so I think way that, okay. before uh, the, the deal was finalized between them anyway. Yeah. But I do think there's a difference in port and just having bad taste and bad sense of humor. And, yeah, and, you and know, with T- being a physic, being an abusive, you know, a, actually abusing when T.J. People. Miller right, did, right. You know, was ten times worse. Right, that dude's abhorrent. Like, that's who knew but, uh, that guy was that much of a slime ball? But, but, I'll, but... I'll, I'll reiterate what I said before. That was recent. That was ongoing. With Gunn, he stopped doing it, and nobody's heard anything from him for the last, well, since he was hired by Disney. And again, if if you can be, if you can be gone after for anything you've ever said on any social media, then this current generation nobody will ever get a job because if you, you you're you're going to say really bad crap you know when you're 12 13 14 15 that stuff is going to go into the record and if you can be taken down any time during your entire life because because of things you said in the past, in in the distant past even then none of us are safe see here's the thing though is he's the only person that have because this has happened where athletes and believe me, I work with young athletes. They say some yeah. of the stupidest crap you could possibly imagine where their words are coming back to bite them. But it's only like it's they're getting slaps on the wrist. Nobody's lost a job. It's like it's like everyone drew the line with gun and went, OK, this is the this is the point. He's the example we're going to use. And that's what sucks is that that's what he is now. He gets to be a martyr in a way, you know, where everyone's like, all right, this is it. This is the line. Now everyone else just kind of gets a well, don't do it again. You know, and that's that's the one thing that bugs me about this whole thing is that no one else is like what, what Roseanne did was was in the now and right it, it was different. This was like you know well well you got one of ours so we're gonna get one of yours and it was like to keep this on, on brand like it's the dark side high father trade you know right. where you're we're both screwed so now we have peace. It's it's zero. That's sum. how I feel about this. Yeah, that's how I feel about this, and I just don't. I can't, I don't know, man. Like, I'm going to, I hope they don't make a Guardians 3 because I think it's his, you know, I do believe in the power of, of filmmakers and I think he is the the one voice that was able to stand above kind of what the Marvel movie is. Because, and I said it because Guardians 1 is such a different film than any other Marvel movie. It has, you know? it has heart. It's, it's not, not like the other movies were. It's not. It's, it's not. Just, it's a writer who gets the flavor. His had heart. Right. And I love, I love, don't get me wrong, but there's just, like, we never got, got robbed of Edgar Winters, um, Edgar Wright, excuse me, <laughs> Edgar, Edgar Wright's Ant-Man, but in a much different movie, Demento Brothers, right there. Um, we got robbed of that and got Peyton Reed, who did a great job, but it wasn't what it could have been. Like, Guardians feels like a, like a director's movie. Like, yeah, it's all got all kinds of studio influences, so don't get me wrong, but that movie is uniquely James Gunn. Mm-hmm. And there's things in it that that you can see a, a director putting his stamp on, which you don't see in most of the Marvel movies. And I guess that's what that's a shame to me is that, you know, we're not going to get that again. And I don't want to see it again, quite frankly. And if that's, I think, you know, if we're punished, then well, quite frankly, we should all get punished. And I wonder, because the, the cast is still revolt, aren't they? Batiste I mean, is the one who's still, who's kind of drawn the line in the sand and, and being like, I don't think I want to do this anymore. Yeah, well, this, this is going to be like the current Star Trek franchise because Pine and, uh, for Star Trek Four, Pine and and Thor, <laughs> they, they, neither one of them are signed on for the the next series, and the rest of the cast is certain roles. So if this, if that happens with this, with no, Batiste no. so, so, le- so leading the way, um, what is? I, I guess we haven't talked about this. Uh, um, Batiste is under contract, so so right. he has to do Guardians Three. We all have to do Guardians Three. If there is a Guardians Three, and right. they have agreed. Uh, to use Gunn's script because that was apparently one of the things Batista was talking, made a big stink about was, well, if they don't use his script, then I, you know, you know, I really don't want to do it. So they've agreed to do use his script, but they're gonna have 
you know, somebody else give it a once over. That's what's going to happen. It's going to, it's not right. going to be, it's not, it's, yeah, they'll this probably take the same plot and some of the same jokes might be there, but I mean, it's not going to. This know. is Donner all over again. Kind of. Yeah. Probably. So. So, yeah, that's where we're at with, with, with that side of it. Like, they're going to use gun script. Uh, they're all under contract for the movie. Um, the question is, will they come back for anything else after that? But let's use the right language, though. They're going to base it on his script. But like you said, if they're going to, they're going to give it a once over, it will not be his script by the time it gets the film. It might not be, but I mean, the, he had a co-writer on the first one too. So. Mm. Everybody has a co-writer. Every movie has script actors. Right. Everything gets, but when it's your, when you're directing it, you get to, you know, it's different. Right. So. Right. Because then you get to edit or you have a say in, in what takes are used and that kind of thing. So yeah. Yeah. It, in, in, on the one side, you get something the way the director envisioned it. And the other side, you get, somebody with super breath blowing ice cream into somebody's face that for laughs. So, Oh, Donner. Like, okay. I was, yes. I was trying to put the connection in my head. Yeah, yeah. All, all, yeah. All that, all that slapstick stuff in the original Superman in 78 was not part of Donner's script. Right. That was all brought in later. So, so Again, not not the movie it could have been. Though I'm going to play a little bit of devil's advocate here. Um, Please. I I wonder if Disney wouldn't have come out and made enough, you know, basically come out and said, no, we're not going to rehire them uh, if there wasn't such a backlash. Do you know what I'm saying? Like, like there wasn't just an immediate backlash. This went on for a couple of weeks. Of oh I'm you know Batista complaining online and and other people saying other things and then the cast getting together and writing a letter all these articles and everything coming out and you know petitions coming out and and maybe Disney was just like you know what we don't want any of this publicity so if we just make a firm line in the sand and say we're not hiring them then you know that'll put us but that would be stupid because all 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 of that. Like all, was it? What's the saying? A- any um, any coverage is good coverage, or you know, it's. Well, we we live in an era that proves that's not true. That's not no. I, what I'm saying is, if maybe I, if there was for the most part, it still holds. Maybe if people just let the news come out and said something the first day, but then let it drop and then keep talking about it for two weeks, maybe Disney wouldn't have come out and said this. No, I, I I think the opposite. I think that oh, yeah. I don't think he gets a second meeting if people don't if if there's this much of a stink okay. over it. Yeah. Edgar Wright, Edgar Wright didn't get this much, you know. Joss Whedon didn't get this much when he left. Was you know, they they wouldn't have a, they wouldn't have agreed to use quote unquote use his script. Yeah, yeah, um, that would just throw the whole thing out. You know, Disney can waste a couple million on the script; they don't care. You mm-hmm. know, um, no, I think the only reason we're still talking about it is because it is. Like, it's certainly a divisive topic. It's one that seems to have struck a nerve with people. Like, usually, you know, these things happen all the time in Hollywood where people leave movies and it just becomes a thing and we forget about it. But this one was so unique in its circumstances. There's just no way it blows over. And maybe Disney thought it would, but I think that might have been short-sighted on their part. Okay. I don't know. I don't know. You might have a point. All right. I might. I usually don't. Or at least just the point on top of my head. Uh, But it's hard to tell with these big corporate entities kind of what they think. Because, I mean, they don't have, like, you know, corporations aren't people. They're giant groups of people who do group think. So you never quite know what what they're going to do, you know? Because you're looking at consensus, not a decision. Yeah, and that's why – yeah, but it seems like, to to be fair, it seems like Alan Horn is kind of the guy who said, no, this isn't happening. And I don't know what's going through his head. If this is we can't survive the PR, or if maybe he's like f that guy. I just I hate what he tweeted that much. I don't know, you know. And I think that's what kind of makes this more interesting. Is like we don't 
know what the other side really thinks. We just get the corporate right. speak. Yeah. All right. Well, we're going to run a little long, so we're going to skip the next article and get right to our super secret bonus interview. Uh, it's another one from the Great Philly Comic. No, Wizard World Philly this year. And uh, another interview by our great John O'Grady. Uh, and it's Maxina Storybrook. So, John, you want to tell us a little bit about this? Well, she's somebody that we've interviewed once before, mm -hmm. and I've seen her at a couple of places now. She's a very young author, and she's got a book, a couple of books now. The first one's Denarco. It's a series. So it's Denarco, then Echolane, and she just came out with Carney like uh, a week or so ago or a couple of weeks ago. And um, she's, she's, she's really interesting to talk to about this stuff because it's inter it, it's it's well first off it's like you jd it makes me feel really inadequate because she's so young and yet she's already got three books out and she she pops these things off like like they're candy so um yeah and, and enjoy the uh the conversation so this is john o'grady superhero speak and i am sitting here with maxina's storybook who we interviewed last year at the Wizard. Was it the Wizard or was it the Philly Comic Con? I forget. It was the Wizard the Wizard Philadelphia last year. Yeah. Yeah, I've got the memory of a goldfish, so, you know. But I did read your books. Yeah. And, uh, uh, well, when I first talked to you, there was only one out, and now there's two, and you're working on the third. You keep, you keep making reference to it on Facebook. Yeah. And... Yeah, which is really aggravating because you're like, oh, this, this, that, and you're like, yes, can I actually see the manuscript, please? Because I want to, <laughs> I want to know, I want to know why you're so excited. <laughs> but uh, here we are. Uh, you've got a booth set up. You've got book one, book two, but you branched out. You've got a, uh, what is it? You've got jewelry. You've got um, a lot of paraphernalia that you're selling with uh, images on it. Puzzles. Book. Uh, playing cards, journals, mugs. The character cards? Is that... Yeah, the character card packets. Mm -hmm. I actually have them in color now, so that's really fancy. Yeah. Stepped up there. <laughs> and I was talking to your one of your friends here mm -hmm. about the character cards because when you're reading the books, the image in a person's mind is from your description and from how they act and from your own personal experience. Then you get to see the character cards, and you know it could go one of two ways. It's like, oh yeah, that's exactly the way I thought they looked, or who the hell is that? <laughs> <laughs> so, uh, do you do you find people coming up and talking to you about those uh, at all, or is this what that's the way they've always looked in your head? And that's pretty similar to how they looked in my head. I actually hired an artist for them, and she did a spectacular job with them. I absolutely love her artwork, and. To me, that is what they look like, and I've actually had fans come up, and I had a couple of them look at them and be able to identify all of them, because they also envisioned them the same way. Apparently, my descriptions are pretty, pretty good enough to where they can walk up to my table and say, that's this character, isn't it? And I'm like, yes. It's like, cool. So I was imagining them pretty good, which is a... Very, very good feeling for me. Yeah. Uh, also, um, well, we'll go into, because I read the books, uh, one of the things that I've found that's hard for some authors is when they write a character that they like, you know where this is going, then the character is no more. So what was it when, when you, did you always have that in mind that you were going to kill off and, oh, yeah, oh, this okay. is a, it's a spoiler. Okay. This is, okay. Spoiler alert. It's a yes, spoiler. Yes, I kill off my own favorite character. Because oh, who's your favorite? Of, yes. Oh. I actually bawled. I tried my hardest not for that character not to die. I wrote it so that that particular character, I'm not going to name that character. So <laughs> That's no, far enough. Yeah. <clears throat> Yes, I do kill off characters in my books. <laughs> yeah, no, it's but, not, it's not to the level of Game of Thrones. Yeah, but but 
I tried saving different characters to try to keep them from dying. But when I tried continuing to write the series mm -hmm. with those characters still alive, Mara, the main character, did not progress how she was supposed to. And I have a saying, Mara doesn't die. Mara dies in those scenarios where the other ones don't. Mm -hmm. And so... Oh, okay. Yeah, Mara does not die. That is a rule that I had to make with my editor. <laughs> no, I'm just joking. It's always been uh, in my mind that Mara survives. And well, she kind of has yeah, to. Yeah, I mean. she kind of has to. She kind of has to. But... No, certain characters, I've tried saving them, and it just hasn't worked out. It's it's quite a weird thing. It's not so much that I'm writing the story that I'm coming up with it. It's I'm transcribing it onto paper for other people to be able to enjoy it. So, to me, I guess you could consider it like a transcriber trying to put down history to, onto paper. Gotcha. And so, that's what it feels like to me. And I by me trying to overwrite history... It ruins everything because I see from the beginning all the way to the end. Mm -hmm. And if certain events don't happen, then the world is screwed. Essentially. So it's basically like killing Hitler. You kill Hitler, everything goes wrong always. And what, yeah. you, what you're saying is, and other authors I've talked to say this too, it's like the story has a life, it's a life of its own. Yeah. Or in your case, you know the history, the whole history. And yeah. if everything doesn't happen the way it's supposed to, your character either dies or doesn't become a hero or whatever. Mm -hmm. And that's why you have certain yeah. characters have to have things happen to them. <laughs> Just... Yeah. Well, in Carney, the third book, I uh -huh. am actually really, yeah, I, I'm starting this one. Carney is actually where things do start tying together. Okay. And you really start understanding why what had happened in Dunarco and Echolane had happened. And so I know it's in the middle of the series and everything, but mm -hmm. once you hit Carney, everything starts clicking together. And I will admit, this is my favorite book to write. It's taken me a little bit longer, but it's because those dots are connecting. By a little bit longer, it's only been, you've only been working on it a year, right? Yes. <clears throat> Originally, I had been hoping to actually publish it by the time of this convention, mm -hmm. but I've had to extend it a little bit because of, you know, trying to connect those dots and make sure that everything was in line because I like to tell good stories and good stories are my passion and my job. <laughs> and by giving it that little bit of extra time, it's turning into that perfect book that I always dreamed it to be. Do you find uh, some of your fans coming? And you, you, your fans, you've got fans coming by here now. Yeah. I mean, this is your second year. Yeah. Uh, do you find them coming by, hoping maybe you'll bring a character back, or or do you find that they're they're liking the direction, or maybe have people come up with suggestions? I mean, how, how does it? What's the fandom like? For somebody who's getting into, you know, their second book, third book now. The fandom is actually quite interesting. Um, I'm still encountering some of the repeats here at Philadelphia. But when I was down in Pensacon, in Pensacola, Florida, mm -hmm. at the beginning of this year, it was quite funny because I was having all of these fans, because that's where the biggest fan base is right now. Okay. I was having all of these fans running up to my table. And going, where's the next book? Like, that's literally all that they were saying. That's say. literally what I did when I came up to get the interview. <laughs> where's the next book? I need the next book. Oh, you have Echolane out. Oh, no, you have this out. I need it all. Yep. And so I asked them, how are you liking it? And all they're telling me is, uh, I absolutely love it. Now, can you leave me alone and let me read? <laughs> because I've, I've had a couple... Who actually, I had I had my cover reveal live stream there. Okay. And so one of my fans actually was just standing off to the side waiting for the cover reveal live stream, reading. Reading the next book for the third time. Nice. <laughs> so it was, it was really awesome just seeing that because by seeing my fans loving my book so much, it 
really, really makes me want to write more. And it's, it, it gives me this warm feeling inside of me, and it just it helps my creativity levels and helps me keep pushing forward. And you get feedback from, well, uh, social media, right? Because I know you're on Facebook because I follow you there. Mm-hmm. And you're, again, you're constantly dropping little hints and things about, yeah, I did this and Carney, and Carney's coming out soon. And, you know, but do you get, do you, do you find that drives a lot of people um, to, you know, get really excited about the next thing coming up or, or bring in new fans, say? I'd like to think, I mean, this is really actually the first time that I've really tried doing this particular technique, but the, you mean with Facebook and all that or the, uh, Facebook for the, um, little tidbits here and there about the upcoming books. Okay. Yeah. Is that what you're talking yeah, about? Yeah yeah, yeah. 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 I'm, I'm essentially trying a new technique with that to see, you know, trying to get interest here and there, go ahead and start building up the hype and everything because a book won't sell if no one knows about it. Yeah. No one will be able to buy it if they don't know it exists. So I try to keep my fans engaged because it isn't just me putting out the books. It's also keeping the people informed, too. It's like, hey, if you like the first two books, here's the second one that's coming out. Hmm. And here's some little little nifty reminders. It's like, yeah, don't, don't forget. <laughs> well, you, you said that uh, the fandom gives you energy you yeah know, it makes you excited to do things yeah so when you're doing little tidbits you know tidbits in uh mm-hmm. facebook and you get a lot of reaction from that is that like little minor energy boosts during the process yeah yeah most definitely um it's actually going to be really exciting when people start noticing the uh carnate quotes that we'll be posting soon hey, hey count me in <laughs> Because that's that's when it'll be really interesting is seeing seeing the reactions to those because I, I handpicked a lot of the I handpicked all of those quotes to go up online. Oh good. The most controversial, so. the most maybe misleading ones you're gonna <laughs> A few who will which will probably make everybody go, Oh my gosh, what is that from? <laughs> ah, I know. How far off are you from the third book now? Mm-hmm. How far off are you, uh, is the third book? How, when when do you think Carney is coming out? Are you still you still writing it at this point? Or is... I'm actually in the polishing version of the editing phase, so I'm really focusing on the more minute details. My beta readers are really helping me out right now, mm-hmm. and then the next stage after that will be formatting. Mm-hmm. So it's probably going to be released in July. The very beginning of July. Cool. Yeah, if you'll pause for a second, I'm going to put that on my calendar. No. Uh, <laughs> now, another thing that lately has happened in the world of literature, right, with like it, the genre that I follow most is urban fantasy. Mm-hmm. And you see a lot of writers like Ilona Andrews, Jim Butcher, um, Faith Hunter. They're writing small uh, novellas on the side, other points of view. Uh, when I came up to your table, the, you've got an, a little novella here. Uh, yeah, a novelette. A novelette. Yeah. Or, of a different point of view, not from the main. Yeah. So is that something, because your world building is so uh, large, Best. right? Yeah. Do you, are you finding that you can't tell the full story or there's other stories you really want to tell, but you can't do that? And you write, you write third person present tense, which is... Yes. In, inter- an interesting tense in and of itself, yes. which would normally allow for that kind of thing, but you, you've got this novelette now. Is there a reason why you had to do that as a novelette instead of in, in the main book? Yeah, actually, the main series follows Mara DiNarco. Right. And that novelette actually follows Kale Burnett, who is Kimala's older brother, who is only mentioned in passing in Chapter 10, Vial of Life of DiNarco. Mm-hmm. And that's the reason why I actually have a quote-unquote reading placement for my novelettes is because they're literally side stories for the fans. My fans request them. My, uh, More specifically, my patrons on my Patreon request them. And I'll write it, and they'll get a handbound copy, and then I'll publish it officially to the public in a nice little nifty book that you saw on the table yep. later on. 
So they expand the universe, but they you don't need those to read the main story. No, you do not need them. They're just more for the fans who want more. Mm-hmm. It's like I'm actually going to be coming out for one for a lyric. One of the characters. Okay. Oh, yeah, 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 yeah. Explaining his past and everything else. And then eventually I want to do one on Chenille as well. More for myself. About his tail and his ears. Okay, so it's not it's not directly uh was it uh drawn from your fans. It's more of you've got this huge universe in your head with all these moving parts and there's stories that you wanted to tell that you've got in your head that can't yeah, may not yeah. have a direct influence, but you really want to get them out so you get these novelettes. Yeah. yeah. I, and, and essentially I'm using my fans as a as a way to moderate myself from overwhelming myself from writing too much because there are so many side stories that I want to write that mm-hmm. are companion to the Denarco Quartet, not required, but just as like little extras. But I never know where to start. And so when my first patron actually requested My Unsung Hero, my first novelette, Mm -hmm. I was like, because they wanted to know more about that character. He was only mentioned in passing, and nothing else was really said after that. But that one patron wanted to know more, and that gave me the idea, let my fans pick my novelettes. Okay. Yeah. But you'll pick some, too, from what you said. Yeah, yeah. Well, the one with Lyric takes precedence because, well, the patron did ask for that one. Oh, okay. So it's a patron thing, too. Yeah. Nice. Uh, Now, here's something. You're on your second book. Mm -hmm. You're almost done with your third. Mm -hmm. Is this something that you can make a living off of now? Is it, it, you know, for, like, with all, with the... All the paraphernalia, all of the uh, tie-in uh, merchandising that you're doing, mm-hmm. and the books, and novelettes, and maybe other stuff I haven't picked up on yet, is it is it enough to make a living off of, or you, is it something where you have to get like past book four, book five, and then the sales from those, in addition to the new sales, is enough to be, you know, solvent? I I ask because there's a lot of starving artists. You know, yeah, just in this building alone right now. Yeah, most and, definitely. Um, I'm slowly getting there still. Um, it's definitely better than last year. <laughs> yeah. Um, as long as I, you know, I'm I'm usually pretty good as long as I do a big convention a month or every other month, and then that can pretty much support me to drive up the interest in the books. Get yeah, get drive new up readers. the interest in the books and also give me enough money to actually put food on my table. Mm. But. <clears throat> Really, my my best advice to all of those starting starving writers, yeah. writers specifically, because that's mainly what I'm focusing on mm-hmm. myself and what I know about myself. I'll share the same advice that I was given: keep writing. Things start looking up with the third book. Things really start looking up with the fifth book. Okay, it's around the fifth or sixth book that I've heard. You know, fifth or sixth new book on the table. Mm. Uh, not including novelettes, main series. So with what's on my table right now, I technically have about three books. There's Denarco, Echolane, and uh, From Inkling to Ink, Scratchpad. But those three, yes, once I had those three on the table, I did see that my sales went up a little bit. But I'm really starting to see the advice that I was given. With the more books on the table, the better. Especially if you have books in multiple genres. Okay. Yeah. Uh, because then it's then it's more interest. It's more interest. You reach to a larger crowd. One person might buy the scratch pad, which is a writer's toolkit, mm-hmm. while someone else might like the sci-fi fantasy in the Denarco Quartet. And where'd you get the... Uh, who gave you that advice? Actually, different writers who have actually been successful. Um, in Pensacon... I met writers who had written a lot of books, and all that they had to do was just sit back and watch people walk up to their table. There was this one woman who literally sold out of nearly all of her books, and she had brought eight different types of books to her table. Wow. 
Okay. Yeah. And then another one was actually a successful fantasy writer who had like six or seven books in his series already there. And he even had enough to like do a map and everything else like that too. And so he was able to make a living off of his work as well. Okay. Yeah. I, I have to ask that because not just out of self-interest alone. I mean, I've talked to somebody like uh, at the Great Philly Comic Con, Jody Lynn Nye was there, who was the woman who uh, took over for Robert Aspirin when he passed away. And she has her own, she writes like two books a year. Yeah. And I know that, that you can make money off of that. But she does lots of different genres too. You're right now basically writing a single storyline. Uh, and there are a lot of, because of the way things work these days, and you go on to Kindle and sell through there, you don't have to go through the main publishers. There's a lot of people in your position right now. Yeah. You know, like, I got these books. Will I be able to get out of my mother's basement anytime soon? So. Yeah. The other, the other thing about it is that you also can't just let the book try to sell itself because if it's just sitting on your shelf waiting for someone to like go on to eBay and find it, yeah. it that's actually not going to work because people don't know about it. It all circulates back to do people know about the book. So when you're an independent author like myself, you actually not only have to be the one to write, you also have to become a marketer as well. So it isn't just so much about writing the books. It's also about trying to let everybody know you wrote these books and they're mm. out there for people to read too. And when you re you release on Kindle, because I have your books on Kindle, yes. which means that signing my phone will not be very good for, you know, autograph. Uh, but I know Kindle, it, there's several different ways of uh, independently selling your book. But with the Kindle, I know that every once in a while they'll do promo promotions with Amazon Prime. If you're an Amazon Prime, you can download a book for free. Mm -hmm. Do you find that that helps? Or... I actually don't know if my books are a part of that program. Okay. I haven't heard any word and my sales haven't dipped or anything else like that with Kindle. So if it has been in one of those promotions, then who knows? It's yeah, it's a it's a jungle figuring out all of that. Uh, it definitely is. You push your books out how though? Uh, are you directly through Kindle or are you going or Amazon or do you go through a uh, different? How are you how are you publishing your books? My books are on so they're on uh, Kindle, mm -hmm. obviously, and Amazon. Mm -hmm. My website. Uh, Audible. Okay. And iBooks, actually, Who, through the Apple Store. Who'd you get to do the Audible? Audible, Stephanie Bentley. Okay. Yeah, she's a SAG AFTRA voice actress, and she did a fantastic job. Like, I I was the one who actually had to go through and make sure that she did all the inflections and tonal uh, dialects right, and, and the name else. pronunciations, the and... name pronunciations. <laughs> The bane of every fantasy writer. <laughs> yeah. But despite all of that, I was getting caught up in my own book. And I've read this book hundreds of times. Yeah. I'm so sick of Denarco, honestly. <laughs> you know, I can talk about it all day long, but just don't ask me to read my own book again. <laughs> uh, that is how tired I am. But when I was listening to her read it, I got caught up in my own book again. That's and awesome. I got that spark of excitement again when she had read that. And even now, I can listen to my book on audiobook, and I'm still enjoying it. And it's been, it's been over half a year since it's been out. Echo Lane just recently got released on audiobook as well. Okay, you get the same person. Same person, yeah. Excellent. No, I'm I'm not planning on changing from Stephanie Bentley. She did she did such a perfect job. Oh, cool. Okay, so uh, remind me again what happens in uh, three. Uh, yeah. <laughs> Things come together. Together and things start making sense. Making sense. Making sense is good. <laughs> well, I'm not saying that the other books didn't make sense, but they do leave you with questions. Oh yeah, no, I have those questions. <laughs> <laughs> Everybody's nodding around us. Uh, okay, so yeah, I I'm really glad to have caught you here. Uh, this is the second day of the great of the yeah, Wizard World Comic Con. What do you think of the convention so far? It's doing pretty good, I think. Um, about what I expected for Wizard World Philly. Mm -hmm. um, 
being in the vendor section is actually really quite nice because they gave me a bigger table and a bigger space, which is definitely what I needed with all of my products. Yeah, and you have quite a few here. Yeah. Uh, what was I going to ask you? I was going to ask you something else. Now I can't remember. Ah. Um, all right. So you're on, you, they, people can find you on Kindle. They can find you on Goodreads, uh, Facebook. Oh, yeah, I'm on Goodreads as well. Yeah. yeah. Well, and yeah. I'm, Facebook, Instagram, Twitter. I'm on those as well. I'm I'm slowly trying to learn the Instagram crowd. So Instagram's interesting. Just don't do Tumblr. That just just never do Tumblr. <laughs> eh, my, all I have to do is press a button and it cross posts. <laughs> Tumblr is to Instagram what 4chan is to Reddit. I just it's not good. <laughs> Oh, I do have a Reddit, but I'm still trying to figure out how to use that, too. <laughs> oh, and that goes back to what you're saying. You you can't just be a writer. You also have to be a promoter, which means yes. learning all of this social yes, media thing. Yes, and it's definitely very time-consuming. <laughs> okay, well, again, thank you for taking the time. I'll let you get back to hopefully signing a bunch of uh, autographs yeah. and, uh, and selling more books, and I'll eagerly be awaiting, you know, <laughs> Uh, your third book in and July. Thank, I'm going to hold you to that. <laughs> and thank you. Thank you for taking time out of your schedule to interview me again. This is my schedule. <laughs> you okay. are my schedule. All right. Uh, well, thanks. And uh, we'll talk to you again. All right. All right. Another great interview by John with uh, Maxina there. Um, thanks again for doing the show. That's ours. That is the second interview we've had with her. Um, we're going to yeah. have to get her on for a full episode one of these days, I think. Um, but, uh, yeah. So, I think that's a good place to put a pin in it this week, boys and girls. Uh, so, thanks for listening. And don't forget, uh, if you found us on Facebook or Twitter or something like that, don't forget to check out our uh, homepage, SuperheroSpeak.com. And uh, follow us on all the social medias. Plus... Don't forget to check out uh, nerdpodcastmafia.com for some other great nerdy podcasts, including So Wizard, and uh, you can also catch some of those Dork of All Trades uh, episodes on there. So, again, until next week, thanks for listening, and don't let your cape be caught in the door. Have a good week.